Make Real specializes in creating immersive learning solutions across a range of technologies. To download their latest academic paper on how to turn learners into activists, visit makereal.co.uk slash activists. Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new season of Great Minds on Learning. In this highly acclaimed series, Professor Donald Clark, internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode explores the theory, such as it is, behind learning styles. While extraordinarily popular in both education and workplace learning, learning styles is reviled as lacking any real scientific basis. And it also has, as we'll see, slightly shady origins. If you can't say anything nice about somebody, my old mother used to say, don't say anything at all. And that might be one of the reasons we've held off from tackling learning styles so far in this series. series. Because it seems to be pretty well accepted among those who really know their learning theory that this is one set of theories of which to steer well clear. I'm sorry if there's a bit of a sting to this because I know it's so widespread people might well not know this still. (laughs) Um, But it's not really that highly regarded. Nevertheless, it is still, despite all the best efforts of these cognoscenti, not least among whom we should count my esteemed fellow presenter on this podcast, Professor Donald Clark, who has often weighed in on the subject, It's extraordinarily widely supported and believed in learning styles, both by educators and workplace learning professionals. Every one of my four children, I think, has at some stage of their schooling brought home the diagnosis that they were a visual learner or an auditory learner to be met with a parental eye roll. And notionally, I should count myself a kinesthetic learner, perhaps, because merely opening my LinkedIn feed of a morning will often cause me to start banging my head against the desk repeatedly as yet another training manager drops an expansive TLDR post about this wonderful thing they've just discovered called learning styles. However, I've come to learn during this series of podcasts that there's almost no area of learning theory that does not, under the right degree of scrutiny, yield up some sort of insights. Donald, you tend to take a strong view about most things, but we are not about black and white, out of hand dismissals on this podcast. There are shades of grey in everything. We are a nuance seeking missile. Um, But Donald, give us an overview of this particular subject area. What can people expect from our survey of learning styles? Yeah, well, there was a very interesting report by uh, a a, a rather sober report by Glaswegian guy I know called Professor Caulfield, who, this was a government-inspired report that came up with 71 different learning styles. Of course, he dismissed almost all of them as hokum. There were about 13 that really sort of demanded attention, but even then, it was a process of just demolishing this edifice. And it it seems that it's a conundrum, really, learning styles. It seems to be a sort of the meme that refuses to die. It's a bit like Dracula, in a way. You know, it just seems to come back at you relentlessly, no matter what you do, no matter how much research there is. To the contrary, uh, to be fair, there is there is a little bit of science at the core of this, which is that we do cognitively have separate visual and auditory channels, for example. But the idea that there are basically three or four normally, it's funny how it always drops into a little grid of four or three, uh, it, it, identifiable essences or traits, as it were, as learners has now been fairly well disproved and debunked. So I think it's a a rather odd area to be discussing since we're discussing something that the science says doesn't really exist. However, it's worth sitting back and going, well, why is it so prevalent? I mean, why do the majority of lecturers, the majority of teachers, the majority of even lay people still have this phrase learning styles rattling around uh, and renting their, their, their brains, as it were? And I think it comes down to something that's very common in L&D and education in general, and that is if you're teaching, you ne- need to get something to get a grip of. You need some essences, you know, those little sort of essential oils that you're going to either turn into a course or turn into a questionnaire, or in this case, turn into a huge marketing scam, I think, 
a you know learning people like the idea that you can measure and identify traits leadership traits for example you know uh, which is the basis of most really bad leadership courses uh, so I think there is a tendency for learning professionals to try and latch on to, uh, let's say, intelligences. We covered this before, multiple intelligences or emotional intelligences or the big one, of course, Myers-Briggs. Let's have four little mm. letters that define your personality and decide whether you get a job or not. This notion of essentialism, I think, lies at the heart of it, of it all. I think that's a good intro. Um, you've kind of avoided some of the... Uh flaky origins of um, learning styles, but we're going to get into that now as we move forward into di discussing these, these individuals. So first of all, Richard Bandler, born in 1950. Richard Wayne Bandler, according to Wikipedia, is an American consultant in the field of self-help. According to his own website, which calls him Dr. Bandler, he is also a mathematician, philosopher, modeler, teacher, artist and composer who's left a legacy of books, videos, art, audios, whatever they are, art, students and a body of knowledge that will change therapy, education and medicine forever. Born in New Jersey, had an abusive father. This is a very sad story. When his parents split up, he was abused by his mother's new partner. Um, and there, there, there's a peculiar story about how he... Uh, stop the abuse happening. His mother's partner had broken every bone in his body at one point, he, he, he says. Uh, but he got his own back by uh, wiring up the door and electrocuting him uh, at the age of 10. Tough beginnings. Got his BA in philosophy and psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and his master's in psychology from Lone Mountain College, San Francisco. He was influenced by Gestalt therapy. And with linguist John Grinder unfortunate surname perhaps, he founded the Neuro Linguistic Programming NLP approach to psychotherapy in the 1970s and he's been promoting NLP ever since and is still at it, as far as I know. In a profile of Bandler written for The Guardian in 2006, John Ronson writes, some people hail the way NLP has seeped into training programmes in businesses across the world. Others say terrible things about NLP. I'm finding it hard not to lapse into the voice. John Ronson is kind of, you know, such a, a, a podcasting presence. They say it is a cult invented by a crazy man. In the same piece, Bandler claims that NLP came to him in a series of hallucinations. So perhaps not much of an empirical evidence base there. Donald, I strongly sense you're about to say terrible things about NLP and in particular yes. about its founder. <laughs> we'll want to know, we'll want to know how NLP fits into the learning cells picture and whether it has any real validity. But first of all, there's a headline story about Bandler that we yeah. can't in all consciousness ignore. Donald, tell us about the murder. Yeah, as I was listening to you there, John, I suddenly, this started to sound like one of those true crime podcasts, you know, so who done it type things. You know, this terrible background of this guy who turns into the, the serial killer or whatever. But there is a, a totally bizarre story uh, around Bandler, which is not a story, but very, very true, and that he was uh, taken to court. He was arrested for murder. So picture the scene. There was, uh, there was Bandler himself. There was uh, his cocaine dealer, a guy called Marino, and there was a prostitute uh, who was a, uh, uh, now Bandler admitted in the trial that since the 70s, he made a lot of money in NLP, he was a cocaine addict. Uh, in any case, the trial was truly horrific. So there were two guys there, Bandler and his friend, uh, Marino, and one of them using Bandler's .357 caliber Magnum, so it was Bandler's gun, one of them shot uh, the prostitute in this case, who was a, a woman called Christensen, uh, shot her to death. Now, the, uh, the only reason that no one got actually put in jail for this is that both Bandler and Marino pointed the finger at each other. So the jury literally couldn't decide who pulled the trigger, even though it was Bandler's gun. So we have this right, you know, I mean, you give that biography, but, you know, this guy, uh, this guy was no angel. He, 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 he may have killed someone. He may have killed someone, that's definitely true. But in any case, he was clearly tied up in some things that were less than ethical. So I'm not too sure, you know, when I think about NLP, I think about Bandler and that incident and go, I, really, uh, you know, is this, is this in line with your company's values? <laughs> I think not. Hmm. Uh, it was simply the, the jury couldn't decide who had pulled the trigger in this case. Um, we don't necessarily require our th learning theorists to be saints, although some of the ones we will be covering later in the series are, in fact, actual saints. 
but you know in this case that that might seem to shed a bad light but but there is a in, inherently also there's a rather culty aspect to nlp isn't there as well this is very true and uh, its origins are very odd so we have a, a grinder john grinder and bandler who come together and it's a curious cocktail of hypnosis in fact the hypnosis element is really rather really odd if you typed in NLP in the sort of, you know, the 90, well, the 90s, early days of the internet, you would often get these websites coming up on how to almost hypnotize girls in bars. You know, it was like one of those mm. horrible date, almost date rape type techniques. It, it was really hideous. But hypnotism lay at the heart of this process. It was a well marketed cult based on these parlor tricks, uh, in a way. In addition to the hypnotism, of course, they did claim that it was absolutely scientific. You know, you can tell it in the name, Neuro Linguistic Programming, all about neurology, linguistics and uh, programming. Well, it's not about any of those things, in fact. What it was, was a series of tricks. It was great for classrooms because uh, at the heart, it wasn't a unified theory. You had this mixed bag of things, really, that came together in these incredibly expensive training courses. Way back in the day, thousands and thousands of pounds you had to pay to attend one of these. One was using keywords to predict what you were going to do or think, a uh, keyword or predicates. The other one is to look at your eye movements. In other words, if you're talking to somebody and they suddenly look up to the left or right, you could read something into that. You know, it was diagnostic in some way. But the big one, of course, at the heart, heart of all this is what they called... And they were, you know, trying to bring pseudoscience called a primary representational system, what they called the PRS. And what the PRS was, was learning styles. And this is where you ha had this first tripartite distinction between the visual, the auditory and the kinesthetic. This came into right. NLP in the 1970s. OK, mm -hmm. now it actually came from a mixture of Gestalt stuff from from Bandler. I don't think Grinder had much to do with this, to be honest. I think this was Bandler's side of the equation here. Uh, but, of course, since then, we've had nothing but an enormous mountain of evidence showing that this is not only not only that these things don't exist, but the, if you assume they exist and try and apply them, they're actually harmful to learners. It's worth saying, I think, that there, that, that there are a number of reputable uh, trainers and even now kind of learning gurus who... Um, in the past have been NLP practitioners. Don't worry, I'm not going to name names. It, it was extraordinarily kind of um, yeah. endemic within the, the stand-up training world already by the time that kind of e-learning uh, yes. uh, yeah. arrived, I think, you know. Um, so, I mean, perhaps we shouldn't kind of, you know, um, demonise those people for having been taken in, but it, it seems like it was a bit of a cult, a bit of a con. Yeah. It was odd, though, because it was sort of a bit... You know, a bit like astrology, really. You know, this idea that you can you can identify somebody as a Sagittarian or whatever, and you can identify somebody as a kinesthetic learner. It had we that, love that stuff. Yeah, it had that sort of feel to it, and of course, it was marketed like crazy. These guys made huge sums of money from all this. Mm. But I think it's worth just looking at the evidence. There was a, a, heap, a heap of evidence, and a heap with, in about 1989 was the first who came out with a, a really con condemnatory statement, a research about NLP, and that. In a sense, he said, this is not science at all. You know, this keyword, there's no evidence for this keyword stuff or especially the eye tracking stuff and that it didn't improve rapport, which they claimed it was, you know, NLP was all about getting rapport with someone as a manager or uh, with your workforce and so on uh, or in personal relationships. But Heap was the first who found that NLP had, you know, it was just found to be lacking. There was just nothing, no substance. It was all conjecture. Uh, then Sharpley uh, was another, you know, another heap of, uh, of criticism loaded onto NLP there as well. And he really looked at how little research evidence there was actually here. If you look in the literature, where is this stuff? There was absolutely no support for this PRS or representational system. And there was no evidence of its usefulness as a counselling tool. You know, even in the practice side, never mind the theory, there seemed to be very little evidence. Hmm. And so the data didn't support it. And then you have big reports who really thought that it was really dealing with outdated metaphors of how the brain functioned, you know, you know that, that was the problem here. And in the 90s, a very interesting paper by uh, Sweeten and Bjork, uh, and their claim was that, you know, the conclusion is there's little that any evidence at all exists to support, support the claim, especially this notion that it has any social influence on other people, because that's what mm. you were buying when you bought the £3,000 or $3,000 course, influence over other people. 
whether it's in sales, management, or personal relationships. Hmm. Now, what happened was about 1990, really, I think going into the 90s and early 2000s, it just came completely off the boil because suddenly people realized this is a bit odd, this. Uh, and then we had you know, the, uh, Efren and Lucan sort of wrote a really interesting paper. Well, there was a, they would really just made the claim that NLP, the original interest in NLP, had turned to absolute disillusionment by this time, you know, after the research. Uh, you hardly ever hear it mentioned, even in psychotherapy, never mind psychology departments. Uh, I is hmm. now quite famous in the psychological field, you know, he uh, he's coming out saying not one iota, not one iota of clinical evidence uh, lies behind any of this stuff. And then a famous Corbolis paper, which is another really interesting one, uh, that went a little bit further, claiming that it was absolutely fake. NLP is a thoroughly fake title, they said. You know, in other words, it's more than it just doesn't exist here. This was actually a cult. It had nothing to do with neurology. Uh, Bierstein includes, the, uh, include, uh, you know, describes it as being a, a total con, you know, the sort of new age fakery. That's the status it began to get in the 90s, alongside mm -hmm. things like, uh, I mean, Bernstein equated it to Scientology and astrology. It, it got that bad. Uh, but the bit, and uh, Witkowski, a really interesting Polish guy who I knew, uh, certainly online, had lots of communication with him, who had this big database of evidence, massive database, uh, completely debunking it. Now, the interesting thing is Bandler, this was water off a duck's back, of course, to the NLP people, because Bandler didn't think that any of this empirical stuff was relevant at all. Uh, even though he sold it on the back of pseudoscience, when science came to bear on the subject, he completely dismissed it. But the bottom line here is that, uh, you know, the Caulfield report in the UK really knocked it on the head, I think. You know, 71 theories, you know, it's clearly all over the place. It, by and large, mm. has disappeared now from clinical psychology or academic research. However, it hasn't disappeared from the common imagination uh, or indeed in schools and universities. You can, you can go on almost any university site, type in learning styles and find a whole page on the subject. It just hangs around like a bad smell. So that's the origins of learning styles, really. I think we can situate yeah. there. Let's yeah. see what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could stop there, really. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not. Neil D. Fleming, 1939 to 2000 through to 2022 I, I can't even do the date yet <laughs> sorry I've had a holiday break and just everything's disappeared Neil Fleming was a teacher from New Zealand who taught in universities particularly Lincoln University teacher education centres and schools can't imagine a, a more different character than um, Bandler really for nine years he was a senior inspector for the over 100 high schools which involved being a critical observer of over 9,000 classroom lessons and it was this experience that started the thinking that eventually led the thing for which he is famous. He turned V-A-K into V-A-R-K, VAK into VARK. And I don't mean to in any way disparage his work by putting it so simplistically. Donald, though the whole Bandler NLP setup feels incredibly flaky, we are dealing with someone here as a serious educator, uh, Fleming, and seems to have arrived at his system from a basis of observation. Does Fleming's take on learning style have any more validity than Bandler's? Well, not really. I mean, we have to be careful. It, it, you know, Fleming was a teacher who based his theory on his personal observations. You know, there was no research, no real science behind any, any of this. It was like the guy from Ofsted suddenly decides to come up with a learning theory. You know, that's, that's the sort of status it has, really. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's a seriously researched topic by Fleming. Okay. But to be fair to Neil Fleming, you know, his heart was in the right place. He was trying to do his best for the, the children he saw perhaps being badly taught or well taught. Uh, but certainly during the 80s and 90s, this is the one that really, forget the Bandler stuff for a moment, this is the one that took hold. Everybody knows VAC, you know, everybody knows the, the visual auditory kinesthetic learning style. It gets quoted at you endlessly uh, and it's all over the internet, of course. Uh, but, it, you know, Fleming, this was about 1987, I think it's 1987, his theory comes out and it's a, it, it's not just VAC, it gets sort of abbreviated to VAC, 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 which is visual learners, auditory learners, and kinesthetic learners. But there's another category on top of the visual here, which is the R, as in VARC. And that was the read, reading and writing. I mean, you, obviously, this is the odd thing about VAC. He goes, well, what, what, does VAC, what does a visual learner mean? Does it include reading and writing? And for him, it does, of course. So yeah. it's really V-A-R-K, 
But it's still ridiculous. I mean, the idea that you have auditory learners who have what was some sort of weird preference. Well, I mean, what we say is, wait, you know, do they just listen to podcasts? Is that what all, all they do? Uh, you should although, do. Although that is. <laughs> uh, his proposition was that these are kids who prefer to listen to the teacher speak and maybe students in lectures or tapes and so on, as opposed to visual learners who prefer for images, photographs, you know, perhaps even nowadays video but also reading and writing. And kinesthetic learners are those who like the sort of tactile, you know, fidgety, physical experimentation, as it were. And, of course, you get this big bundle of kids when they're very, very young, and they all have these traits, you know. They all don't pay attention when you try and teach them, uh, when you talk to them. They all don't pay attention when you try and present something visually to them and so on. And this gets misinterpreted, I think. And some sort of essentialism, this essence in these children, as if you could put them into three buckets. Uh, mm. And this crude cat categorization, totally unresearched, uh, is a very, very dangerous thing. But it got sewn into the very fabric of learning theory in schools and universities and also in corporate learning, especially in the government side, public sector. It was all over the place, this VAC learning styles thing. And the problem is that, so we have Caulfield again, my great hero in this area comes along and said, hold on a minute. So, you know, despite all this research that shows they don't exist, and all, but we still have these incredible claims and belief systems in our, in our educational system and, and in L&D. And uh, even his report didn't knock it off its pedestal. OK, but his report was interesting because he really went along with quite a few researchers said, listen, it's worse than just being a waste of time. And by waste of time, I mean, the people who believe in learning styles tended to produce three different lessons, as it were, or, uh, mm. you know, had that we have this overproduction of content and effort by teachers. What Caulfield and others were saying was it's actually quite dangerous here because, you know, that kid who isn't reading or doesn't seem to like to read, that's the very kid who needs to be taught to read. <laughs> in other words, we tended to shy away from the essential skills that the learners needed because we had some fatuous idea that they were a kinesthetic learner when they were mm. just the young kid who fidgeted a lot in classrooms, as almost every child I've ever known, including my own, have always done. So I think the problem here is that the theory leads to impoverished learning, you know, because it, it, it distracts from what you may need to do. The weaknesses they have may be the very things that need attention in that child. That's mm. why it can be so dangerous, if that makes sense. Yeah. And isn't this a big logical problem at the heart of, the, the whole thing that even if you accept that people break down into these different cat categories in terms of their learning preference, the idea, would would it actually make the learning better if if you played that preference back at them by creating learning which was kinesthetic, ordinary, or whatever? I mean, that too needs needs proof. It seems to be a leap. That's right. That yeah, this may turn too often. I think there was another little diagnostic thing which I rather like. Roger Shank uh, was big on this. Uh, is to say that what 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 teachers and trainers are doing here is making a category mistake. When you have 30 kids in a classroom, we all know, we all have kids, <laughs> yeah, well, they, many of us uh, do, and they have different personality. Now, personality is a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I have twins. It's like a living genetic experiment when you have twins. And of course, they're not uh, identical, but it's quite clear that some of their personality is baked in. It's genetic. It's about 50%, in fact, when you measure it. Mm. Judith Harris famously did the work in this area. And yeah. I think what people are doing is mistaking differences in personality for learning styles. Mm. Uh, because the extroverts obviously get, tend to get classed as uh, the kinesthetic learners, the introverts perhaps more as the visual learners, and, all, uh, and, and those who like social interaction a lot, uh, uh, more extrovert-like auditory learning. So I think, uh, I think Roger's probably right here that it's just simply a category mistake, mistaking personality differences for internal cognitive traits about learning. So moving on to Dr. Rita Dunn and Dr. Kenneth Dunn, uh, Dunn and Dunn. Rita Dunn taught at uh, St. John's University, NYC, a uh, private Catholic university for nearly 40 years until her death in uh, 2009. Her husband, Dr. Kenneth Dunn, is Emeritus Professor, City University of New York, Queens College. Not a lot of biographical information for either, but their version of learning styles called Dunn and Dunn was a massive hit, more so in the US than on this side of the Atlantic. I, I'd never heard of it here in the UK. Uh, a big hit from the 1970s onwards. They gave us the learning styles inventory 
We love a numbered list on this podcast and their preference <laughs> inventory has five domains, uh, environmental, emotional, sociological, physiological and psychological. Donald, with the work of these two, it certainly looks like learning styles is getting more complicated. But is it losing in any way the slight whiff of snake oil? Yeah, you're right about the biographical thing. It's incredibly difficult to find anything out about these two people. Yeah. If they seem, you know, when I was when I was researching the article years ago on them, the the interesting thing was it seemed like you know one of these American couples who are really Russian sleeper spies or something <laughs> that had erased all evidence of what they, who they were on the internet, and you can't even find. I mean, it's very difficult to even find pictures of them. There's one I had to get from the cover of an obscure book about them. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, so done, done and done and done, done, done and done, as, as, as you might want to call them. But they seem to be nice people, to be fair. And but if not a tad naive. But to be honest, they're learning styles theory. So in the UK, you have this dominance of the Fleming theory. Hmm. In the US, however, done and done with it. Now, this tells you something, isn't it? It's just flavor of the month type stuff here. It's not hard science in any sense. But to be fair to these two people, uh, Kenneth and Rita, let's call them that. I mean, they came up with an inventory which is very, very different. It's not as sort of, it's not as intense and essentialist as VAK. Okay, what they were trying to do is create this environment where you could sort of optimize progress for these for for the children or students you were teaching, and so they came up with a checklist. There's always a questionnaire. There's always a checklist. Don't trainers and teachers love checklists and questionnaires? Uh, but what they wanted to do is come up with a more holistic sense of a child when they're learning and try and create the absolute optimal environment in which that child or student would learn. The problem here is you have to do it for every individual child. But the bigger problem is that there are five things here. It's worth going through the five because they're, they're, I think they're quite reasonable. Uh, there's the environmental, the first one. That, that's the sort of preferences you might have around the learner. You know, the light and temperature in the room, the sound, the seating, you know, these general envi physical environmental concerns, fair enough. I'm not too sure that you need to do that for every child, though. I would imagine mm. that a fairly average temperature set by a thermostat for all the learners in that room would be reasonable. If that's not their view, they wanted to personalize it. So environmental was the first one. The second one was emotional. And this is an interesting one, I think, because I, we did a whole podcast on the mm. role of emotions in learning. And it's certainly the case that, you know, in a distribution curve of emotions, uh, you know, emotional uh, temperament in a classroom, you certainly get those who were easy to tip over into a more emotional state. So they thought that emotional was the second criteria. You pay attention to those, perhaps their ability to persevere with a task or stick with something. Do they need more structure, more help from the teacher? So the second emotional one, I think, is quite reasonable if you're dealing uh, with especially younger children. The third one is sociological, so we've had environmental, emotional. The third one is sociological. And this is, you know, the social context in which learners prefer to learn. They thought this was a preference, that some people like to learn on their own, solitary learning as well. Some like to be paired up with people, like, you know, in other words, like two best mates, buddies, as it were. Some mm. like more a wider type peer or group environment to learn, okay? And then there was also the social relationship with teachers and lecturers and adults. So this was an attempt to identify the sociological or social context or setting for a learner. So we've got environmental, emotional, sociological. The interesting ones which veer towards learning styles are the last two, and that's physiological and psychological. So this mm -hmm. is a checklist, remember, we're going through them one by one. Physiological is really these perceptual issues, you know, and I was, uh, uh, well, there's some basic things like what, what, is the, what is the child's nutritional needs, their mobility, you know, are they mobile, uh, you know, do they have any disabilities and so on and so on, those obvious things. But some subtle things like what's the best time during the day for this child to learn? The trouble with this is it gets so personalized that you, if you came up with the ideal optimal plan for every child, you'd have to have really one-on-one -on -one tuition. Yeah. And then the last one is psychological, and this is where learning styles gets folded in here. And then they try to identify the traits the child might have around learning. Okay, mm. hey, do they like the big picture conceptual stuff? Do they like theory, blah, blah, blah. And this is where they sort of brought learning styles, and that's why it was called a learning styles checklist. This is really based around the, the psychological one. And people quite often just throw VARC into that category there. So this is a quite a long checklist. We've gone through it. Some people just take yeah. the VARC or VAC one and throw it in at the end. But they, they did have their own little sort of schema here that was quite well ill-defined. And this 50 years this thing's been going on in the States, the done and done checklist, it's still all over the internet, it's still very, very common in schools. It's still used. 
Yeah, and you know, it's an odd one. We've criticised the others for the signs, but this one is more, you could criticise it as a practice in many ways. Because, right. you know, as I've said, does it make sense for every? They try and personalise it, but some of these things actually make sense for everyone. Why, I mean, the average temperature in a room, for example, or the yeah. light or a classroom environment, why would that differ for different students in many ways? You could say, see how some people, maybe autistic kids, might have a problem with certain traits but that's 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 an issue in itself that needs to be dealt with sensitively and separately mm. a, but it still produces the overproduction of learning materials when you actually read what they recommend for schools it's all about producing multiple versions of everything or sat, trying to satisfy every individual learner because they're all different in actual fact in learning that's incredibly difficult because it becomes incredibly expensive and of course mm. you have the old learning styles questionnaire even though it may not exist at all. So I think in many ways, it's not really a theory, it's more of a checklist. And they do fall into the trap and the end of identifying these little traits under the psychological uh, category in their checklist. I think this is interesting for us in that it seems like it's starting to move learning in the direction of personalization, yeah. which is of course something we know all about now. Now we have the technology, we have AI and so on. Uh, we have ad adaptive learning. Personalization is is a, a, a big ticket thing for learning nowadays. And yeah. perhaps the, this is the conceptual conceptual beginnings of, of beginning to bring that in um, long before the technology actually existed. Yeah, but it, and, and a sub, it is. But again, it's it's a bit like a, another category mistake. Personalization isn't about, well, what's the preferences of the learner? Because yeah. as Bjork and many Others have shown that learners tend to be quite delusional. You know, they think they're sitting watch Netflix or a video and they think they're learning. It gives you the impression you're learning or you sit in a lecture and think you're learning, but actually it's in one ear out the other. People are quite delusional about what they think, how the strategies they should for learning. Real personalized learning, which is now being enabled by technology, is all about being very clever like a teacher and presenting the right thing at the right time time for an individual. In other words, you get stuck in a mathematical concept, you can't go any further. Well, let's unlock that. Make sure you don't try and go further and fail catastrophically until you've got that concept, because mm. everything else depends on it. So it's a different, there are two different meanings of personalization there. And I think if you personalization back, for personalization by yeah, and exactly. the mix of the two. And if you just okay. fall back into preferences, you fall back into old learning styles theory and, and, and imagine that people are in, in a state to, to make preferences optimal, but preferences aren't, They're, they tend to be delusional. So now we come to David Allen Kolb, 1939, who was born, born in Moline, Illinois, a US psychologist and educational theorist who has published on experiential learning, individual and social change, career development and executive and professional education. He's the founder and chairman of Experience Based Learning Systems, Inc. Uh, interesting how many of these people actually had companies to, to promote the idea. And an emeritus professor of organizational behavior in the Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western Reserve, University of Cleveland, uh, Ohio. Much better documented bio, I have to notice here. And he, he seems like an altogether more serious figure. Yeah. He's famous for his four stage learning cycle, the stages being concrete experience, observation and reflection forming abstract concepts and testing a new situation. And this is in a little box with arrows and you can circle around it and come in at any point. I came across this uh, model when I was researching learning experience design a while ago, um, not knowing anything at all about uh, learning theory at the time, and thought it's an interesting way of describing how we learn, but in the end found it actually a bit baffling when I tried to apply it to, to any sort of actual experience of learning. He divided learners into four groups. Um, of course, he always have to divide learners into four or five groups or three. Yeah. And his division was convergers, divergers, assimilators, and accommodators. Donald, can you tell us more about this and whether Cole perhaps adds something more significant to our knowledge of learning than those we've talked about so far? Well, you're right. I have more of a soft spot for David Cole, and this, this is a serious guy, you know, and who had done his reading and uh, built his theory of experiential learning or learning by doing was built on a whole load of work done by Dewey, Lewin, Kurt Lewin and Piaget. So this, you know, this was a more serious academic figure, as it were. And I like him because this focus on experiential learning is quite important, learning by doing, because it's often something that's been sidelined as we've developed, you know, very theoretical 
uh, courses, whether it be in our universities and schools, uh, you know, uh, you would, uh, the, the, the tendency is to teach kids a dead language like Latin rather than any useful practical skills, for example, which still baff baffles me, really. Uh, but it's true in universities, which are very highly theoretical. Uh, it's also true in training courses. You know, how often you go into a training course where it's basically a load of theory from PowerPoint with very, you don't do anything. <laughs> it, it's totally and utterly bizarre. Uh, that, yeah. so, that, so I think we have to, you know, give them due respect for the fact that you have to recognize that we do learn experiential, we learn by doing. So Cole with his mate Roger Fry came, came up with this, you know, this experience, you actually do something, you then reflect or observe others doing it mm -hmm. uh, and learn from that. You then go on and try and form, oh, that's interesting. You know, like starting a business, you may try and do the accounts and then go, God, I actually don't know what, I don't, what is a balance sheet again? You bring in the theory on the back of the, the effort to solve a problem. You then mm -hmm. try it out, you try and build a balance sheet and then you go back and uh, try to do it again. So you get this sort of loop. The trouble is that is that was quite heavily criticized by Jarvis as being too simplistic. In actual fact, learning yeah. is a much messier thing. But what we're talking about today isn't really the experiential learning thing, although the learning styles came out of this. So it's in, right. it's in his book, Experiential learning, learning, that this is explained. But again, here we have another, you know, there's so many learning styles theories. Where, you know, which one do you land on here? You have such a choice. And that's not really science. You know, if you've got 71, it tells you the science is not very good. But he, he, he focuses on these convergers, divergers, assimilators, and accommodators. And I think this is, again, just an attempt to get this nice four-way split as if we were very neatly fitted in as something that's easy to put on a PowerPoint slide. Hmm. I mean, the, just to, to reiterate what those are, so convergent thinkers are those people that they, they, like, they like theory. They like taking abstract ideas and then applying them in the world. Uh, you know, so yeah, I'm going to read about the balance sheet and then I'm going to try and build one. A diverger is much more, let's jump in and do it sort of thing, you know, like uh, it, mm. it, they, they use concrete experience, you know, and, 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 and the cold cycle. Remember, this comes out of his experiential cycle. So the divergers are, are more likely to learn by doing. The assimilators, they, they combine the two. They'll take all this abstract reason and they'll learn by doing and bring it together, you know, the sort of synthesis. Uh, uh, approach to learning and the accommodators they again use experience and experimentation but yeah they just sudden, they just adapt as they go on you know jump in learning in the workflow might be a good description of accommodators but it's not yeah. at all clear that people fit into these and neat categories at all and of course what happens is people write a questionnaire yeah and then automatically shove them into the categories. But that's the old problem of, you know, the Texas sh uh, sh uh, shoot map problem, which is you throw, you, you know, you shoot arrows at a wall, you draw a circle around them and say, hey, look, I hit the target. <laughs> that's yeah. what those questionnaires do. They pre-decide what the target's going to be and guide you towards it. Uh, mm. So in that sense, I think that's where the mistake is made. Is there any kind of hierarchical progression in those four things? So, you know, is there a kind of an ideal that the the others should be moving towards? Or? Well, not, not really. No, the, for Cole, this was tied to his cycle. You know, his cycle, he thought you could jump into that four-way cycle and experiential learning at any point. And that these yeah. four, sort, in a sense, were the traits that different types of learners had. And it was where did they jump into the cycle, if you want to mm. if you see it in that way. So... It was a nice, consistent theory, but the learning styles thing, I actually quite like the core experiential model. It was a bit too simplistic, really, as subsequent research showed. But then the layer, he tried to then template learning styles on top of it, and that's where it all goes wrong, because like the previous ones we've examined, they just don't exist. <laughs> that's the truth of the matter, you know. So he had less, the learning styles, he's better known for his experiential learning than learning styles, but it's still a significant learning styles theory. Why? because it was the basis of a much more famous one in L&D, certainly in the UK, and that was what we'll come to next, Honey and Mumford's learning styles. Great link. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
things like yeah. uh, dyslexia or the fact that someone had ADHD or, or whatever, as you know, as you say. Anyway, he got a degree in psychology from Hull University, where he knew Philip Larkin, and a dip ed from Oxford. Uh, then went into industry um, after national service, worked for Ford and British Airways before going freelance as an occupational psychologist in the 60s. Rather less biographical information for Professor Mumford. Both Honey and Mumford believe that most biographies are boastful and boring. And in fact, they both use that identical phrase. Uh, <laughs> they're, 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 Honey, Honey's biography is weird because he says that and then he gives you <coughs> so many facts about his life. He gives you the address where he was born, the, the day he was born on his star side. He doesn't give you a birth date. I find that odd. <laughs> <laughs> but Mumford was, was born and raised in Lincoln, UK. He's written books about management development. Um, seems also to, to be a cartoonist, but, you know, very, very sketchy bio there. I th they, you know, to be fair, it's from a pre-internet age. It's difficult approach different approach to that most famous together is the progenitors of honey and mumford learning styles they divide learners into four groups um you might detect some weariness coming into the list <laughs> yes again uh, are you an activist reflector theorist or pragmatist donald i was once in a room with peter honey um just enough to get the kind of you know patrician vibe but you have actually locked horns with him Tell us about that, can you? And a bit more about the theory of learning styles he originated with Professor Mumford. Yeah, well, he's the only one in the, the group we're discussing today, John, that I, I have actually met. But it was a rather odd meeting. I was set up, in a way, by a good friend of mine called Eric Parsler. So Eric uh, was running a company. <laughs> he set up this conference in Oxford, and I was giving a keynote there. And I did what uh, I'm about to do. I was, you know, I was one of the very early people who were very critical of learning styles, and I gave a critique of the Honey and Mumford model. And of course, what Eric had not told me is that Peter Honey was in the audience. <laughs> so this was unfortunate because Peter Honey is actually a very nice guy. And uh, so I met him briefly afterwards and he was sort of laughing it off, but I'm not too sure. I think, you know, he was basically saying, hey, this is my life's work and you've just trashed me sort of thing, which wasn't my intention. You know, there's nothing personal about this. It's science, it's theory as it were. Uh, but it, I, you know, the thing that I, I say is a really nice person because he, he, did, he did tell a really interesting, it still sticks in my mind to this day. Uh, we were discussing how, you know, uh, you know, I was blogging a lot of the time. He was writing books and, and stuff. How when he was sitting at his desk in his little office in his house, if his wife came in and knocked on the door or put her head around the door, he would instinctively lean forward onto the keyboard to pretend he was working. <laughs> he said, even with my own wife, I have to make myself look busy. And I thought, oh, this, is, this is an interesting guy. You know, he's quite subtle in his thinking. I, I, I liked yeah. him. Then I had a subsequent email exchange with him saying, listen, I... I, please feel free to just tell me what the science is here and I'll, I'll quite happily recant what, what I had said. And of course it never happened because there was no science really. I think, you know, he, he threw in Alan Mumford, Professor Alan Mumford to give it some scientific validity, but I don't think it was. It was actually lifted straight from honey, from uh, Kolb, to be honest. So we did the right. Kolb one. What he did was uh, he, he just turned them into, you know, different types of so activist dive in and learn by doing the reflector. That's more observational, theoretical thinking, reflective type person, a reflector. A theorist, you absolutely require the theory. Give me the model, give me the concept, then I'll do it. I won't do anything until I understand it. And then it's like a pragmatist, the experimenter who goes forward. This is very, very close because it was copied from Kolb's Convergers, Divergers, Assimilators and Accommodators. So the accommodator okay. is effectively, in Honey and Mumford's uh, terminology, the pragmatist. Now, hmm. what Honey and Mumford very cleverly did, like all the other people in this area, is build a company on the back of a questionnaire. So you had to buy the questionnaire. Now, the questionnaire was interesting, completely bogus, I think, but it did something interesting, which is it didn't try and identify your learning styles, which is neat. All it did was ask you questions about how you behaved in the workplace. OK, so what do you actually do? Not how you learn, what you actually did, how you made decisions, give you little, little scenarios and so on. So. They then had a, a system, God knows, you know, the magic sauces that were behind the scenes, how they calculate is, is bizarre, really. But they then translated that into learning styles. So, so unlike the VAC people and uh, the Bandler uh, crowd or NLP people, they didn't fall into this trap of labeling people strictly as VAC and then teaching those styles, right? That, that wasn't the point. The point was not to see them as fixed, you know, innate qualities or cognitive traits. The, uh, within individuals, 
But actually, the very opposite of the back people, the idea was to tackle your weaknesses. In other words, if you were overly theoretical, well, maybe you should think more about practice and the application and transfer of your learning into performance. Now, that's quite neat in a way. You know, in other words, it was, it was almost flipping the other people's theories on its head. The idea wasn't to stick, recognize that these people had innate learning styles and that you pander to their preferences. It was to tackle the things that they were weak in. But again, right. if you don't have a solid theory behind it, is your diagnosis about their weaknesses going to be correct? Well, it may be a little bit there, but uh, that, it's more a sort of praxis issue, this. You know, yeah, well, let's, let's make sure people do a bit more learn by doing is what it comes down to, as opposed to people who tend to train or teach people in a very theoretical manner. Okay, so Donald, um, as we get towards summing up, how deep-rooted is this? How far back does it go, do you think? Well, that's a good phrase, deep-rooted, because I think it is really, really deep-rooted in the way we think and the, the history of thought, as it were, almost a cultural phenomenon. Because you might go back to the four humours, for example. So if you go back to the Greeks and medieval beliefs, remember this lasted for centuries and centuries and formed the basis of science in those days, the basis of medicine, which is why we had all those bizarre sort of bloodletting techniques and so on. So the four human uh, humors theory was a form of essentialism like learning styles, you know, the phlegm, blood, yellow bile, black bile, at yeah. least four ways split. And that, of course, was used as the basis for all human psychology and medicine for centuries. Mm. Uh, and then we had, of course, the deep rooted, this sort of need we have to diagnose and categorize people is perhaps most commonly seen in almost every culture in astrology. We try and map yeah. people's personalities or how they think to these rather weird metaphorical associations with clusters of stars above our heads. So it's this sort of animism, this the search for essentialism, I think, that lies behind learning styles and many other, many of the theories that I think are wrong. You see, mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier in, in learning styles, for example, yes, we have quiet leadership. We have, you know, we have pick out four adjectives. Yeah, trustful leadership, authentic leadership. You know, we're always looking for these essential qualities in people, the, the magic dust, as it were, that explains how people tick. Yeah, well, we have Myers-Briggs, of course, the famously four yeah. letters. You, we give you four letters and that's it. We've defined who you are decide mm -hmm. whether you get promotion or a job or not. It, it gets to ridiculous levels in this modern age, but it really is a sort of ancient and medieval urge or tendency. It's interesting that it's in kind of personalities and learning styles are the two areas where we find, uh, hesitate to, uh, I'm hesitating over the right word to use, quackery, snake oil, yeah. you know, companies, copyrights that last for years and years and years. And it's this thing of, as, as you say, you know, dividing you up. I'll, I'll tell you who you are. I'll divide you up. In, and this will be an explanation for all the bad things that have happened to you that, yes, it's because I'm this type of person. So now I know what I'm, I'm going to do. It, it, it's interesting that that comes into the whole thing of learning. But yeah. why does that fall within the domain of learning as, as such a powerful magnetic force, which seems to drag us in a bad direction a lot of the time? Yeah, I think it's I think educationalists and learning professionals like such things because if you have to deliver a course then you need these essences you know you need your essential oils as part of your armory you know this is what you're going to teach that's what you're going to put in your slides yeah. <clears throat> these are the things that you're going to hang your hat on because then you have if you don't you don't really have any substance uh, but it's sort of pre-copernican almost you know it's almost like pre-science this stuff as we've just you know, almost flat earthish yeah. and i think I think it's because, you know, L&D and educators are really nice people. They're people people. They want to do, and they often operate in a very social environment, whether it's the classroom, the lecture hall, or even online with groups of people. You're teaching groups. And this social context is an interesting one uh, because I, I think there's a villain in the case. There's always a villain. And in this case, it's intuition. You see lots of people. They all seem quite different. So you need some diagnostic tool to identify the differences so you put them into buckets, effectively. Mm. Now, but that intuition is no better than the intuition we have about, you know, well, the sun came up on the left-hand side there, went and sunk in the, over there. Uh, it must be going around the Earth. Well, no, the very opposite is the case, you know. Uh, so we're still in this pre-Copernican rely on intuition state. So we get this non sequitur, you know. You mm. see that people are different. 
and the non sequitur then is that they should learn differently. Well, not yeah. really. Learning is a much more common thing. You know, we've had several million years of evolution that give us commonality, cognitive commonality. Otherwise, we wouldn't work. You know, it just wouldn't work. There's been convergence, not divergence, uh, because of evolution. So I think post, you know, it's in the post Copernican world, I think the differences are more likely to be in personality and yeah. the learning styles. That's the big category mistake. I think Roger Shanker's right on that one. And that's well researched, the ocean model and so on. I think, you know, you can pick mm. up on that and use it reasonably well there. Uh, the second problem is people like, as I say, people like simple models. You know, some of the big myths in learning, uh, for example, Maslow's pyramid, he never had a mm. pyramid. Bloom's pyramid, he never had a pyramid. Uh, or the, even worse, the Dale's Cone thing, which was a complete work of fiction, still appears everybody. People love either a triangle or a square. These platonic forms, because you can put them on PowerPoint slides really easy. So a four-way grid on a PowerPoint, really easy to do, takes seconds. Same with a pyramid. You can get it from your little, uh, you know, smart art thing in Word. So I think people love that. And all the learning styles theory sort of fits into that sort of, you know, simplistic models. But I'd, I'd put a stronger charge in here as well. And I think there's a bit of anti-intellectualism here. And that, you know, teaching learning is a people business. It's a practice, not... Uh, it's not about theory, you know. You hear that. You hear that quite a lot. The, there's a really big problem with this. If you say it's all about practice, that just begs a question. Well, what is good practice? You say it's all about practice. Fine. Tell me what good practice is. And then you say, well, I think facts good practice. And you go, well, but hold on. We've just looked into this. We did all these trials with people. There is absolutely no evidence they exist. In fact, the evidence suggests that it harms learners. And people then can't come back and say. Well, it's still good practice when I've just shown you it's not. But I think the anti-intellectualism is the refusal to look at the learning theory and the science of learning. And I think that's a bit worrying because no other area of human endeavor is, is quite as anti-intellectual as, as the learning game. Particularly in the corporate side, I think, where kind of the, the words history and academic are pejoratives. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's a shame. I think that's changing, to be honest. I think there's lots of really good people, really good stuff happening there. You know, a, a, yeah. if you've got a couple of conferences, are very different now than the ones uh, when I saw Peter Honey all those years ago. You know, this learning styles was all over that conference work. I mm. think another interesting one was the professional bodies. To be honest, they're, they're really good now. You know, the CIPD used to have a lot of learning styles thing, but you've got some really good people there now who clearly have got their act together and I think quite strong in learning science. So CIPD, ASTD, these sort of people. And I'm not a joiner. I've never joined any of these things. But I, to be honest, they've got, I think they're pretty good now. I don't think they're to blame for this. If anything, they're trying desperately to get us to pay attention yeah. to the science. Yeah. That's where the fight back is um, in, in a lot of cases, yeah. Yeah. But the C CPD is another really weird one. You know, your inset days in schools. I remember when I was a school governor and the, it was really terrible, the inset day content. It, very often that's sort of learning styles, like here's a schema, listen to the schema, it will change the way you teach. And of mm. course, really good CPD is quite scarce. It's often faddish and it often had learning styles in it, in a way. Yeah. CPD is standing for continual professional development. development. That's right. Yeah. So in schools, Continuous, online, perhaps. Yeah. In, in inset days, but you also get trained the trainer courses. That's where all these Dale's Cone and all that sort of stuff pops up and gets fossilized into practice where it's just old theory that some of it was just made up <laughs> like, like Dale's Cone. Uh, but the, then, of course, it, there's another phenomenon on top of all this, and that's the sort of group think. You know, if you hear people saying something often enough, you start to believe it. So the famous Ash research and so on. We find that if you get groups of people who mutually reinforce a concept, which I think does happen with learning styles, then it starts to get the status of science, even though there was no scientific route to it. Hmm. So, you know, when you have a culture that's prone to taking things at face value without reading or doing the research or questioning things even, uh, then suddenly it gets a different state. It's learning styles then becomes this sort of sacred cow, you know, and it's almost like saying that Father Christmas doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, like suddenly if you question it, people go get a bit uppity. And that, that gets really dangerous. If we're in that realm, then, you know, let's throw our hands in the air and give up. Uh, but that that's the route. That's, that, that's the journey to damnation. I don't think that's fruitful at all, especially, and I'll come back to this point because the big point here isn't just that learning styles don't exist and that you're wasting your time and perhaps wasting your money trying to build technology systems that incorporate it or trying to do multiple versions of the same course. Uh, it actually is harmful and counterproductive. 
Now, you said something really interesting in the question here at the beginning, John, which I think is, we haven't discussed, but it's so right. I think what actually may have happened here, this is speculative, I have no evidence for this. I think in the earlier days, before we got really serious about dyslexia, ADHD, autism, and the things that we know a lot about now, and that we're very careful about because these are real things that real children and adults have. We're massively sensitive to those things because we should be. I think that essentially was the the, the white noise or disturbance or friction or dissonance that people experience okay. when they were teaching. And they tried to find a way of dealing with that, which is what learning styles was. You hardly okay. ever heard, uh, you know, of many of these phenomena in the 70s and 80s when all this stuff arose. But of course, into the 90s, 2000s, they became very serious issues in schools and generally in adults as well. Mm. You know, this this idea uh, that, uh, you know, that, well, yeah, but it's perfectly normal to be very systematic uh, in your thinking. You know, it's not it's not that unusual. Many people are like that. Uh, and so I think, uh, but, you know, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, ADHD, yeah. the whole rack of these things now, we know what they are and we have very specific ways of helping people with those issues. And yeah. some of them are not issues, some of them are virtues. <laughs> you know, so it turns out that actually people who have, uh, you know, some forms of, uh, of like autism are actually incredibly focused and incredibly talented uh, musicians or computer mm. coders or whatever. And have, have Simply with dyslexia. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so dyslexia. I, you know, I, I think we've got a more sympathetic view of that. But I think, yeah. I think you, you sort of hit the nail on the head there a little bit. There was a very interesting comment that this Thank may you. have been, this may have been what swung it. Uh, yeah. but it's still hanging around it's still fossilized in all the courses and minds of people like a meme yes and therefore it's not going away so if you want to look at it in uh, the most positive light you know you can look at that era of the 50s 60s 70s at a time where there was a great demonization of, of uh, things like sort of um, learning difficulties dyslexia not much known about it learning styles was a sort of way of acknowledging this without demonizing any of the the, the, the the people in general it's kind of say well just some people are different like, like this you know um what we've seen since is some people have called it a you know a patholo pathologization of, of of a lot of um childhood uh, with you know folks on things like adhd and giving them all ritalin and so on on the other hand the other face of that is that we actually do know more and we're not treating things in a, in a way that actually it's counterproductive just because we're kind of trying to skirt around some issues so i yeah, mean yeah. we need to, to to kind of sum it up now i've got to ask the blunt question is learning styles all just a massive waste of people's time and energy or is there the nub of something useful here that one could build something on is there enough of that to make it worthwhile reading and learning about this group of theorists well I think by and large yes the theorists themselves we can almost place in the shelf and call it history but that history yeah. is interesting. And this little dialogue we've just had here, John, I think is the crux of the matter, uh, because it was a genuine attempt by good people to do good things. And I was trying to diagnose the problems they were encountering, the differences in learners, which, which actually results in serious behavioral problems in classrooms, which is still a massive issue in the educational system. So we had this period when people were trying good people trying to come up with good theories or good ideas that might solve that problem. They happen to be the wrong theories, but nevertheless, we eventually got to a situation where we've had a reasonable, it may have gone too far, as you say, the pathological or, you know, the ridiculously over-therapeutic view of the world, perhaps, but at least we've managed to identify things that you don't split the population up into groups of three or four on a grid. What you do is there are some people who have specific problems with reading and writing. Perhaps that problem is dyslexia. There are some people who find it really difficult learning in the busy, noisy, well-lit social environment of a classroom. Well, perhaps they have, uh, you know, the, I, I, I don't like the word spectrum here because uh, as, the, as the great uh, Bar expert on autism from Oxford, Baron Cohen said, it's more like a constellation. It's a very complicated things with lots of different features, you know. It's not one thing. Uh, but being sensitive to kids who are, uh, have autism is a really a terribly important and useful uh, uh, thing to have. And we're not, con you know, we're not condemning those people as having disabilities in any way whatsoever. In fact, the very opposite. We're looking upon some of those traits as being very often quite positive, just in a different sort of way. So, mm. 
I think learning styles got there in the end, you might say. You know, it's got us to some good theory about being sensitive to the differences amongst learners. And that, that has to be applauded. That's a good summary. So it, it's history in the majoritative sense, but that is an interesting and rich history that's worth exploring. It's been great exploring it with you, Donald. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, it's fun. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark and would like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. Next time, Donald and John will be discussing the theoretical basis behind using virtual reality and the metaverse for learning, and they'll be doing it from the metaverse. Join us, won't you?